Welcome back to The Factory. In this episode, we're going to talk about a glaring problem with PikaDev and how we're going to fix it. We've also got a nice little design upgrade for the PikaDev buzzer. Let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is a really big problem with PikaDev. PikaDev, if you're just joining us, is this ecosystem of daisy chainable devices and they all live on an I2C bus so that you can talk to them all with a single connection from a host microcontroller. These are I2C devices and so of course they have addresses and that means address collisions. For example, the PikaDev color sensor has only one hardware address. This Vemel 6040 has no option for an address other than what is set by the manufacturer. There's no pin that you can toggle to change the address. That means that you can't have a second color sensor on the same bus, and you may have a collision with some other device from some other manufacturer. I'm sure within manufacturers, they all you know, pick a spread of addresses, but between manufacturers, uh, it's not like there's like some I squared C convention where everyone gets together and is like, hey, you have this address, you have this address, Mwah. we can all get along. The PikaDev capacitive touch sensor has only one address as well. So if you want more than three touch inputs on your project, you're out of luck. Unless you use a second I2C bus only available on some devices. Sometimes a manufacturer kind of throws you a bone and includes a pin on the chip that you can break out to like a switch or a solder jumper. In PikaDev, we break it out to a switch so you can change the address without any soldering. So what can you do in the case where you want, for example, more than three touch inputs in your project and you want to use PikaDev. Enter the PikaDev Max. It's kind of been a long time coming. We needed to have a good number of devices in the PikaDev family before we warranted working on something like this. But I think now's the time. We've had chats with people on the forums who want to work with many of these laser distance sensors. Only one hardware address available. You can change it in code, but it resets every time it powers up. It gets, gets tricky. So we're ready for the Max. It's pretty simple. It's just one active device, the MUX itself. We've got the normal PikaDev connections and then four separate I2C channels. And you can switch these in and out independently. So you can have just one channel selected or you can select some combination if that's convenient. The MUX also has three address switches. So you can have up to eight MUXs on the same bus, which is just crazy. You've got so many options. We've selected this device, the PCA9546. Why? Because it's available. There are eight channel muxes out there, but at the time of filming, they're not really available. And we figure four is better than zero. So we're going to stick with this one because it's available, it's abundant, and it's pretty simple to use. Taking a look at the block diagram, we have in the bottom left, our main input bus, the clock and data coming in. And these essentially get teed off and brought up to these common buses where they can be switched in and out independently with say clock zero, clock one, clock two, etc. It's really just a box full of switches. There's a reset line, which we'll just tie high. We don't really need to use that, but it's broken out on the board. And there's A0 through A2, the address controls for a maximum eight muxes. Now, I guess that theoretically means you could have a parent MUX and then on one of its channels, you could have multiple MUXs. As long as they all have unique addresses in their switched combinations, you could fan out from one MUX to another MUX to another MUX. Things could get pretty silly pretty quickly, but it's cool to think about. And so here's a quick demo. I have two PikaDev potentiometers connected to each to a separate channel on the MUX. And these pots are set to the same address. So normally, if they're on the same bus, they would collide. And you can see that I'm getting two values in my shell and I can vary one of those pots and the other pot. And we're getting two independent readings. This would otherwise be impossible without setting a different hardware address. And this is just to demonstrate that yes, the MUX is working. And we're not doing anything special in this example. We're just setting the MUX channel to the desired channel. So if we want to read potentiometer A here, we have to first select the channel that it's connected to. We're not doing anything fancy with initializing something as a muxed object so that you know the, the 
the bus selection is taken care of behind the scenes. This is very simple and intuitive to understand, although you do need to manage the channel numbers. So here, when we sample pot A, we have to select channel zero. And when we sample pot B, we have to select channel one. But here I'm just showing that you can also enable one, two, and three all simultaneously. So you can use an integer for a single channel or a list for multiple channels. Now we could do it so that everything was handled behind the scenes, but that would probably not allow you to mux into muxes. And this is also much simpler to program for me as well. So that's quite nice. Now the assembly is nothing special. We've seen this on the factory before. Align the stencil, apply the paste. But this is the first project where we're trying something a little new with resistor networks or resistor arrays. This little component here is an array of four resistors, all not connected to each other. It's just a bank of four together. These are 0402 size resistors and there's four of them. So you can see it compared to a single 0402 it's, it's about, you know, four times the size. Why might you want to use a resistor array? For one thing, 0402 parts are pretty small. You know, modern SMT machines are happy to place them, but they are still pretty small. If you're going to have a placement error, it's usually because the machine has trouble picking up that part. The bigger the part is, the easier it is to handle in general to a limit. With this bigger part, this network of four resistors, maybe you've got a bit more tolerance in your nozzle positioning. Sometimes nozzles can get a little bit sticky with adhesive from like the film on SMT tape. We call this a sticky nozzle failure where the part sticks to the nozzle even though the nozzle isn't trying to vacuum it on. And it's quite insidious. There's also eight pads and those pads are smaller than an 0402 pad, but there's eight of them. So maybe that means that the part self aligns better during soldering. It's more tolerant to failure. So that's all like the tolerance side of things, but there's the DFM side of things where, you know, designed for manufacture, you can place four resistors in one shot and that adds up. Our machine has eight nozzles and for a typical PicaDev device, we often occupy four of those nozzles, half of the gantry, with just nozzles for placing small passive components like 0402 resistors and 0402 capacitors. If you can place four resistors in a single go, maybe that means the integer number of gantry movements per module assembled can be a lot lower. Maybe instead of having four nozzles set aside for small parts, you have just two. Maybe that frees you up for placing other more specialized parts that require individual nozzles like big diodes, or the sensor itself that goes onto a board. So this experiment could really pay off for manufacturing time and manufacturing reliability. Turning now to the schematic, and it looks pretty similar to any other Picadev schematic. We have our boilerplate stuff, like the breakouts, the connectors, the LED. Here we have the MUX on the right. And, and how do you actually work with these resistant networks in software? Well, most packages will have a special part to represent the network. Here is a single collected part that represents four unique resistors. And so this package will have the appropriate footprint. And so this is very intuitive to work with. You've got four separate resistors. They just happen to be in a group. You can see in this case, we placed a resistor network with four units and we only use three. No big deal. This is kind of where they really shine when you have many signals together that need to be pulled up or pulled down, like in the case of this address switch. Elsewhere in the schematic, we're also using a network, but it's broken apart into like single units. So here for the LED, we're using resistor network one, unit A. So you can actually place the units as individual entities that you can scatter across your schematic which can be really helpful when you don't have this tight positioning of many signals together. Here with these, with these single units, one of them is being used for the LED and another two are being used for I squared C pull-ups. And then over on the other side of the schematic, the fourth unit here, unit D, is being used for the reset line. So we've got LED, I squared C, and like chip functionality all collected together into a single placement. And you know, I thought that resistor networks would probably only be something that someone with a pick and place machine would be interested in using. But actually the hand assembly of this prototype was really pleasant. I placed 
two parts by hand instead of seven by just putting down two resistor networks that were actually much easier to handle than an 0402 part by itself, much easier. You can see even on some pretty average looking solder paste, when I put this part down, I was like, oh, this, this is a risk. Is this gonna solder well at all? But the results are really nice. I thought you would only use them during automatic assembly, but if you're hand building stuff at home, consider using a resistor network. They're pretty cool. So that was a long while to spend on resistor networks. The second piece of news that I have for you is that we have worked on a upgrade for the Picadev buzzer. The, the original Picadev buzzer uses a piezo transducer to create sound. And that's a voltage driven device. You know, we only have three volts to work with, 3.3 volts in Picadev. So finding a piezo that creates some sound at that level is actually not that easy, especially to create like, you know, something that's loud and accessible for most people. This version one design used a piezo transducer. You asked for it and we heard, we've upgraded to this tasty little magnetic coil speaker. So now it's more about current than it is about voltage. The speaker will go plenty loud and it's a pretty simple upgrade. We're just driving it with a, a low side MOSFET and there's a little flyback diode as well, just for the inductance of the coil, just so there's no surprises. And it also has these four address switches instead of the, like, you know, the previous generation, two switches and two solder jumpers, which is really crappy to try to describe to someone that's a beginner how to use. Nice thing about doing a design revision like this is that we could give it the standard upgrade treatment. The original buzzer was using some pretty previous gen program and test philosophy. There's only this single UPDI pin on the back and it was designed to work with this sliding carriage assembly, which was my first run at a program and test jig. And it, it sucks. It sucks to you. I mean, it's nice in that it locks it in and it tests the connectors but it's got this external picket for programmer. You've got to use two USB leads. It's just, it's just complicated. <laughs> but now with the new buzzer, we have the standard five pin program and test header. This has power ground, the I squared C connections and UPDI. So you can program and test through the single connector. Small drawback is that it doesn't test the JST connectors that we use in Picadev, but they place very reliably, so that's no big deal. And it also means that we can use one jig per device. And so just like you've seen in more recent factory episodes, we like to have one test jig specifically for one product. Now you can see this is Equipment 79, the test jig for the Picadev buzzer. That means that we can just get this off the shelf. We know that it has the right firmware on it and we know that it's ready to go for this product. And so now the user experience is to just plug it into the acrylic jig, hit the program key on the computer, and then press the test button to get that beat. And so keep an eye out for these latest version buzzers on the website in the next week or so. In any case, that's all I have for you today. I'm looking forward to seeing how these resistor networks perform on the assembly line and what kind of reliability and efficiency gain we can get from them. If you've used these before and have any other tips or tricks, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. And until next time, thanks for watching. That was, that was a lot of time to talk about resistors. If you're still here, sick. <laughs>